Um, Andrew, that's a very, very sweet introduction. Thank you. Um, my presentation's got a similar kind of message to the previous speaker, Alex Torpy, except that Alex clearly believes in democracy and government, and I don't. Uh, <laughs> uh, I've, got, <laughs> I've, got, I've got 10 minutes to convince you that the current system of representative democracy and capitalism, as it's currently co constituted, is in terminal crisis and that we alone can formulate and implement the new paradigm of political change. But um, at heart, this is a personal story. It's a bit about a journey uh, that could be symbolized by a journey of 70 blocks southwards down Manhattan, a journey from a belief in a system dominated by representative democratic governments populated uh, by people like me, and a, to a, through disillusionment, to a rather different system, a radically different system. The journey started here, at the UN Security Council, where I spent four and a half years in the British delegation, dealing with the Middle East, um, Afghanistan, the Middle East peace process, um, and above all, the issue of weapons of mass destruction in Iraq, which is why I'm no longer a British diplomat, because I gave secret evidence to the first British official inquiry into the use of intelligence in the run-up to the war. Um, and when that, oh, uh, when that uh, evidence was released, sorry, we're still here, um, uh, when that evidence was, was released in 2007, it led to calls for the second official inquiry, the full public inquiry into the war, uh, which is still going on. Uh, my journey ended up here in Zuccotti Park, of course, the home of Occupy Wall Street, though no, no, journey, no journey ever really ends. Uh, and I'm going to try and take you through that journey, not block by block, but through the arguments that convinced me that the current system is not working and that there was a better available alternative from a belief in the representative democratic order that we have today to a belief in self-organized politics, self-organized action. If you like to put it provocatively, anarchism of a very gentle uh, collaborative kind. Um, one of the things that happened to me when I quit the foreign service was that not only was I forced to confront what I'd done as a diplomat, but also what was the nature of the world, what was going on around me. Um, Governments claim to be on top of uh, what's going on. Um, they claim to be, uh, uh, have matters in hand to have uh, the problems under control. Indeed, I had written these claims. I was speechwriter for the British Foreign Secretary, and I wrote these claims. Uh, but were they actually true? The uh, outputs of any political system should be the measure of that, of that political system. We claim to have the perfect model. When I became a diplomat in 1989, the model of government modulated, or markets modulated by government, government uh, 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 checked by civil society, was seen as the triumphant uh, order of the day. It was the end of history. Um, but what has that model actually achieved? You have to look at the evidence. The outputs of any political system should be uh, the basis of our assessment, assessment of whether that political system is actually working. Take two characteristics, take two pieces of evidence from today. In the last three years, the wealth of a very t small number of the wealthiest Americans has, uh, has uh, grown astronomically. Meanwhile, the wealth for ordinary Americans, for everybody else, has declined by an astonishing 39%, reinforcing a trend that has been evident for two decades where uh, median incomes have been stagnant. Meanwhile, in the real world, of our actual real environment, not in political argument or statistics, but in the air that we breathe. Um, scientists have judged that the level of carbon in the atmosphere that we can safely have, uh, will, uh, above which the uh, global warming may run away in an uncontrolled manner, is 350 parts per million of carbon. I don't know if you've been watching news reports in the last couple of weeks, but there are reports from uh, monitoring stations in the Arctic that in the atmosphere up there, that level has already risen above 400 parts per million, a level that the Earth has not seen for 800,000 years. Uh, one climate scientist believes that we're on course for a global warming of six degrees centigrade or 11 Fahrenheit. So, and even if, even if this is supposed to say what the hell is it, is it all for anyway, not what the hell is it all for anyway, um, but even if we restored growth and the model of growth that we have, what is it, what it, what is it we're actually hoping to achieve? Uh, the dream of a humanity freed from the burdens of labor seems to have died. Uh, once it was plausible that we'd all be able to retire at 55. Now that dream seems absurd. 
indeed for many uh, will be working until the day we die. Uh, and even though for those in work, uh, the fact of uh, the specialization of the global economy and the nature of market pressure has produced a, an experience of work which is for many people tedious, uh, producing products which are to a great extent needless, an experience that is for many people meaningless. Is technology going to save us from this rather dismal situation? Uh, again, the evidence is much more ambiguous than we would wish. Uh, technology is, after all, not intrinsically liberating. It is not intrinsically anything. It has no predetermined politics. Um, another way of looking at Facebook's IPO is of one of the largest transfers of wealth in human history, from the many to the few. The network effects, particularly evident on the web, mean that wealth and income is concentrated in the hands of a very few companies, the Googles and the Amazons, and everybody else has to make do with the little that's left over. Uh, in Wall Street, in financial markets, high frequency trading, of course enabled by computers, is one of the reasons we have much more volatility in financial markets and indeed in our economies as a whole. Quant trading has contributed to volatility in prices from everything from equities to food, uh, damaging confidence for future investors and uh, damaging the economies of single commodity exporters, otherwise known as the poorest countries, most of all. In an illustration of the grotesque misallocations of the current form of capitalism, just down the road from here, they have been building an undersea cable underneath the Atlantic to more quickly connect trade uh, between New York and London uh, for quant traders who will rent this line exclusively for a certain fee. Uh, this undersea cable is costing $300 million. The time advantage it will achieve for the traders who use it is 5.2 milliseconds. In security, which of course is government's ultimate claim to give for us, uh, technology has given us new battlefields of cyber warfare and remote controlled uh, drone warfare. Uh, this doesn't actually offer the prospect of permanent peace. In instead, it seems to have delivered us into a situa situation of endless war. We are, uh, it seems to me, in a period of paradigm shift. Thomas Kuhn, in his Structure of S Scientific uh, Revolutions, argued that at some point in uh, scientific change, the contradictions of the current par paradigm accumulate sufficiently that they cannot be uh, dealt with by amendment or refinement of the current model. An entirely new paradigm is demanded to explain the phenomena that are going on. And it seems to me that we're at this moment in history. The current model of democracy and economics, the way we run our economy, uh, we run our society, I don't think is susceptible to refinement or amendment. Do we really think that voting in better politicians or signing an online petition or indeed a paper petition is actually going to change things in the very fundamental way that is required? Um, we need to, it seems we need something much more fundamental that actually can get at the root of the problem. The heart of the problem is agency. Uh, we, seem to, we feel that everything's out of control. Somebody else is in charge, it's not us. Even in government, oddly, I felt this, and even more remarkably, senior officials I worked with, cabinet ministers, uh, people at the very top of government, felt the same way. They'd worked their entire careers to get into government, and yet when they were there, they felt they had no, no real influence over the things that really mattered to them. We've lost agency. We need to take it back. This is the heart of a new kind of politics, a new form of political action that is actually very much available to us. Behavioral research, including oddly by the British government, um, uh, reinforces an ancient truth. The thing that is most influential upon us, the thing that is most able to achieve political change is not in fact government legislation, it's not law, it's not the, the opinions of experts. It is in fact the people right around us, our family, our friends, the person right next to us. And the nature of the world today um, its extraordinary new, new nature seems to reinforce this very uh, ancient lesson. Look at the world today, what do we see? We see a world of billions and billions of actors acting, reacting, and counter-reacting con constantly. It's not order, but neither is it chaos. It's something in between. 
It is a complex system. It is not a chessboard, it is a Jackson Pollock painting. Recent network research um, suggests that the actions of one agent in a complex system can ripple change across that system very quickly. In the 1960s, Stanley Milgram found that there were three social connections between any given Am American and another American. In the, on the global scale, uh, research has found in 2007 that they, that number of connections is about 6.6. .6. And as the mesh of connections in the globalized world becomes ever denser, we can assume that that number may fall. Put this research together and what you find is that the conventional model of politics is turned on its head. Top-down management of complex systems does not work. Authority is not able to effect change. The most effective agent of change is in fact the individual agent. And this gives us a clue as to this new form of politics. I'm going to have to wet my whistle, sorry. What does this agent-led politics look like in practice? Well, it starts with us, it starts in the workplace, it's microcosmic, it's atom by atom, it's about how we decide things together. In the workplace, there are alternatives to the private, private profit-driven company, there are cooperative employee-owned companies which share agency, share control of the company, share benefits, share wealth amongst all of their employees, who in fact, of course, are not employees, they're actually partners. In Britain, Britain's John Lewis retail chain is one of the most successful companies in the country. It's the third largest company in the country. Uh, it scores consistently high profit. It's highly competitive. It's been going for over 100 years. In deciding our affairs together, it seems that representative democracy is not, in fact, truly representative. It doesn't truly include all of the interests at stake. Jamie Dimon at JP Morgan has far better access to policymakers than, for instance, the members of the Occupy Working Group that I'm involved in that's trying to build in a new bank. In fact, that's why we're trying to new build a new bank, because we don't plausibly think that reform of the current banking system is possible, given the nature of democracy today. In deciding our affairs, we can't have government for the people unless it's actually of the people. What this can mean is mass participation in decision making. In Porto Alegre in Brazil, 50,000 people take part every year in what's called participatory democracy, deliberative democracy, taking decisions on the budget of the city. And what this has achieved is extraordinary measurable outcomes. Uh, public services are more evenly distributed, things like school sanitation, um, there's an end of partisanship, there's even an end to the kind of culture of politics as we know it, and there's much less corruption because all decision making is transparent. These outcomes are actually available to us and already, in fact, there are experiments in participatory democracy and budget making, participatory budget making in a couple of boroughs of New York City. But the thing that perhaps we need to change most of all that is perhaps even the hardest thing to change is of course ourselves. Uh, when I left government, I realized that I'd actually forgotten my sense of what I really believed in. I'd forgotten my political beliefs. I'd, I'd lost my political compass. I was, in a sense, hollowed out. Um, emergence. Thomas Hobbes argued that without government, we would have inevitably a war of all against all. This is perhaps not surprising that he concluded this, given that he was writing during the time of the English Civil War. Without government, there is no order. Indeed, this is the fundamental claim of government that is very rarely questioned. But the current system of government, in fact, the current system of democracy and economics that we have, does not, in fact, appear to be creating order. Instead, it appears to be fomenting the opposite. Instead, order can be created from the ground up. This is one of the fa fascinating characteristics of complex systems. The characteristics of um, individual agents do not necessarily manifest as the characteristic of the whole system. For instance, water molecules are not themselves wet. Uh, brain neurons have no consciousness, but when you put them all together, they create consciousness. When you put water molecules together, they create water which is wet. What might this mean in a political system? 
it actually suggests the possibility of something rather extraordinary, which is a deeper order forged by us acting on our richest sense of, our broadest, fullest sense of political convictions, not a narrow model of a conception of the human, of us as mere utility maximizing consumers, but a much broader sense of our own ambitions and aspirations and needs as humans negotiated with each other directly. This might reconnect a society which arguably is becoming more fragmented, not less. But this won't happen of its own accord. This is not an inevitable function of market forces. It's not uh, an inevitable consequence of the dialectic of history, as Marx might argue. Instead, many worse outcomes are possible. Dystopia actually is visible, and it's not very nice to contemplate. If we are to have better outcomes, there is, in fact, only one force that might plausibly produce that better outcome. And remarkably, frighteningly, but also exciting, excitingly, that is, in fact, us. Thank you very much.